All right, if I may have your attention, I know that every, hopefully everyone is enjoying their meal or will be soon, uh, but we want to keep things moving on schedule. And so at this point, if you would direct your attention to the screens, uh, we have some recorded video tributes for Dr. Stewart, and immediately following those video tributes, um, Dr. Nina Banks is going to come up for the next uh, part of our presentation, which will include some additional uh, testimonials uh, for Dr. Stewart, as well as just a description of how we arrived at awarding him with the, the Westerfield for this year. So let's get these tributes started. Jim, it's a thrill and a pleasure to see you honored by the National Economic Association with the Samuel Z. Westerfield Award. Your powerful intellect, warm spirit, and wicked sense of humor continue to be a gift for all of us. A fundamental aspect of your scholarship is your sustained view that the fields of Black studies, uh, you seem to prefer calling it the field of Africana studies, and economics are intimately joined, particularly with respect to giving us the channel toward understanding identity, racism, and inequality. For you, the economist eye is a key element in enriching the quantitative social sciences content of Black studies, complementing its traditional emphasis on literature and history. Simultaneously, economics has much to gain from the critical and frequently subversive perspective Black Studies brings to understanding the human experience in a racialized world shaped by colonialism and imperialism. It's noteworthy that you immediately saw the theoretical possibilities inherent in stratification economics as a muscular bridge connecting the two fields. In that respect, I urge everyone to read your 2008 Journal of Black Studies article, Africana Studies and Economics, in search of a new progressive partnership. When I was editing the second edition of the International Encyclopedia of the Social Sciences, published in 2008, I took the editor's privilege and made the decision to include an entry on stratification economics, even though the subspecialty only had been in play for about two years. You were the ideal author, and you graciously accepted my request that you write the article. You've continued to be one of the major architects in the evolution of stratification economics. Your most recent contribution to the development of the subfield is your paper with Grieve Chelwa and Derek Hamilton in the June 2022 issue of the Journal of Economic Literature, a compact and rich discussion of the core principles of stratification economics. Your brilliant NEA presidential address paved the road to a rich alternative to the conventional treatment of identity and economics as simply a product of choices made over cultural lifestyles. Subsequently, ongoing research you've done with Patrick Mason and with me has extended the mode of thought you introduced. Our joint paper published in 2006 in the Journal of Economic Behavior and Organization, The Economics of Identity, the origin and persistence of racial identity norms has had an impact in clearing the debris away from the approach to understanding identity advanced by other economists like George Akerlof, Rachel Cranton, Glenn Lowry, and Henning Fong. I've heard that you've retired. At least that seems to be your official status. If your example is what retirement looks like, I want to follow in your footsteps. Your research agenda continues to be active, productive, and innovative. In fact, you and I are currently working on a paper together examining what was W.E.V. Du Bois's position on black reparations. We haven't reached a conclusion yet, but it will be a paradox if the author of Black Reconstruction did not endorse reparations for the formerly enslaved and their descendants. We'll see. I'm just grateful to be a passenger on your intellectual train. Congratulations. I'm pleased that the National Economic Association has chosen Professor James B. Stewart as the recipient of the prestigious Samuel Z. Westerfield Award, the highest honor given by the association 
The Westerfield Award recognizes the Black economists who've made a superlative contribution to the promotion and training of Black economists, to the dissemination of information and ideas concerning the economics of the Black experience in the United States and abroad, and to promoting the recognition and understanding of alternatives on the Black economic experience. Superlative is certainly the correct word to describe Jim's professional contributions. His multi-dimensional career includes extended service as a university administrator and exceptionally productive contributions as an African Africana studies scholar and an economic scholar. Remarkably, he has served as president of three scholarly organizations. National Economic Association, the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, and the National Council of Black Studies. He even found time to serve as editor to review the Black political economy. Long ago, I queried Jim on how he was able to maintain an active research agenda in two separate fields while also serving as an academic administrator president of multiple scholarly associations and a journal editor. He answered that he started each day at 6 a.m., did two hours of research, and then reported to work. After that conversation, I decided to start my work day at 6 o'clock a.m. Jim's 1994 NEA presidential address brought together his Africana studies and economics research agendas. This address was, was a groundbreaking contribution to stratification economics. The presidential address subsequently published in the winter 1995 review of black political economy provided the first formal model and sustained discussion of the economics of identity. The visionary conceptualization of race and power provided by Jim's NEA presidential address established a framework for an incredible research agenda. In particular, the presentation discussed the implications of race, culture, identity production for voting, residential location, educational attainment, the labor process, and conceptualizing the nature and significance of economic theory. This remarkable paper separates race, cultural identity production from skin shade, phenotype, or other biogenetic considerations. It also separates race, culture, identity production from specific behavioral assumptions. The Stewart model examines an individual's race, cultural identity as a produced good with positive externalities for one's own group and negative externalities for other groups. Social identity was a substantial area of research in Africana studies long before economists began to consider the topic. Jim's presidential address integrated this Africana studies topic into economics research. I don't recall where or when I first met Jim, but it was early in his tenure as editor of the Review of Black Political Economy between 1989 and 1995. I posed him a question about something that I can no longer remember. I do, however, remember that he listened respectfully, responded thoughtfully, and was genuinely pleasant. I thought to myself, what a great person. The first, this, that first impression has proven to be an understatement. Congratulations, Jim. Very proud to call you my co-author and my brother. Thank you. Greetings to the members of the National Economic Association. I'm honored to be here to recognize my friend and colleague, Dr. James Stewart, better known as Jim. I am so proud of him and to be named, especially for the Samuel Z. Westerfield Jr. Award. He seems like the kind of man that you are today. And I'm sure that you see, looking from above, he sees a man that he has influenced 
and comes and stands on his shoulders. I congratulate you, Jim. Having been the former president of the National Association for the, for the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, and having had that title myself, I honor you and think that you are just the man to be honored. You have shown, especially with Asala, but for other things that you have endeavored to do, that you are African-centered, that you care about your people. Your scholarship demonstrates that. How you organize and lead others demonstrates that. And most of all, you stand for excellence, as this award does. So on behalf of my foundation, the Black Rose Foundation for Children, the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, we congratulate you on what you have achieved in your scholarship, in your service, and being an African-centered man who cares about his community. Thank you, Jim, for your scholarship. I'm Dr. Marlana Karinga, Professor and Chair of the Department of African Studies at California State University, Long Beach. And I'm honor honored to participate in this distinguished and greatly deserving honor of Dr. James B. Stewart with the Samuel Z. Westerfield Award. One of the most accomplished and important scholarly act activists in the discipline and practice of black studies and economics, Dr. Stewart models and mirrors in a definitive way the life of the man for whom the award is named. For Jim also offers a record of legacy and legacy as an outstanding and highly respected teacher and mentor, an institution builder, a university administrator, a self-conscious servant of his people, a socially conscious economist dedicated to economic development as an ethical imperative and a shared good. And as a scholar, activist, deeply appreciative of the cultural richness and instructive value of black life, work, and struggle. My respect for him as a scholar, activist, colleague, friend, and co-combatant on many and varied battlefields of our liberation struggle as a people is at the highest level, having developed over a period of decades, working uh, together and interacting with him in various venues and roles, especially on the board of the National Council of Black Studies. Indeed, I admire and applaud him for the rigor, analytic, insightfulness, and conceptual generative nature of his scholarly work and the diplomatic and effective style of his leadership, but also have equal appreciation for his critical understanding that knowledge is not simply knowledge for knowledge's sake, but essentially for human sake, and thus the need to use it to improve the African and human condition and to achieve and secure the well being of the world. The extensive corpus of his work reveals an impressive intellectual range an interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary competence and an admirable ability to identify and clarify critical issues in disciplinary community and public discourse. It is his early decision to study other fields such as sociology, philosophy, and law, and to integrate this knowledge in the framework of economics and black study that made him the Imhotepian scholar activist he became. And enabled his definitive contribution to the advancement of knowledge and policy in his two disciplines and the academy and society. Jim's pedagogy as both philosophy and practice reflects the triple overarching mission of black studies, cultural grounding, academic excellence, and social responsibility. His record of teaching demonstrates a profound commitment to cultivating excellence in his students, meticulously preparing them to serve their communities, to reimagine and transform society, and to function effectively in the world in the interest of human good and the well being of the world. Finally, at the center of Jim's work is his constant initiative to give deserved voice and value to African people, to study with appropriate rigor, deep reflection, and human sensitivity their lives and struggles for grounding their agency. And as his historical mentor, W.B. Du Bois taught, using the rich, ancient, and variedness of our lives, culture, and history to explain, 
understand and effectively engage society in the world. Pongezi, congratulations, Jim. And in the tradition of our honored ancestors, we wish for you blessings without number and all good things without end. Pongezi, Asante, thanks so much. Good afternoon, my name is Nina Banks. I'm the immediate past president of the National Economic Association. I'd like to thank members of the Westerfield Committee for organizing this ceremony. Our president, Valerie Wilson, Fenema Addo, <laughs> Linwood Taheed, Jave Grooms for editing the videos that we just watched, and especially President-elect Angelino Viseza and Hazel Robinson for organizing this ceremony as well as this morning's Cornerstone Ceremony. In 2020, I had the honor of serving as NEA President-elect and chairing the Westerfield Selection Committee. The Westerfield Selection Committee consisted of then NEA President Linwood Taheed, Secretary Romy Tribble, Unzinga Bruchard, Angelino Viseza, and Treasurer Hazel Robinson. We selected Jim Stewart as our 2021 recipient because of his exemplary service, scholarship, and achievements that in many ways are unparalleled. I will briefly mention some of Jim's tremendous accomplishments that factored into our selection. As we have just heard from several tributes, Jim's leadership includes serving as president of three national associations, the National Economic Association, the National Council of Black Studies, and the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. He has also served as editor of the Review of Black Political Economy, and if you were at this morning's event, you know that, that Jim made it a priority to also publish his research in the review. Jim's service includes the provision of opportunities for junior black scholars through teaching and mentoring, as well as service through extensive public service at the state and national levels for agencies in employment policy, education, human relations, defense, housing, and training for members of labor unions. The reports that Jim developed for these agencies span the areas of equal opportunity, racial diversity, employment outcomes, educational assessments, curricular assessments, and improvements in STEM programs for underrepresented students. Jim's service also includes extensive participation in community affairs, especially in Pennsylvania, where he spent most of his professional career. Although far too numerous to list today, I will mention that Jim served on the Pennsylvania Historical and Museum Commission and the Task Force on the State of Blacks in Pennsylvania for the PA Legislative Black Caucus. Jim's scholarship is impressive in terms of both its sheer volume and its intellectual breadth. Jim's body of work has focused on the political economy of African Americans. In fact, I would say that within the discipline of economics, Jim is responsible for the early development of scholarship on the economics of black life in America because his scholarship has covered so many facets of black life. Most economists focus on two fields, but Jim's expertise in Africana studies enabled him to write about African Americans in the economy very broadly and in ways that no one had done previously. Jim gave us new frameworks for understanding African Americans in the economy by incorporating power relations. His concept of scholarly activism as underpinning the intellectual history of African Americans has shaped my own understanding of Sadie Alexander's life as an economist in the public realm. Jim has authored, co-authored, edited, or co-edited 13 books, 
including Introduction to African American Studies, Transdisciplinary Approaches and Implications, which is a main text used in Africana Studies. Jim is the co-author of The Pathbreaking African Americans in the U.S. Economy, which you saw on Patrick Mason's slide, which provides a political economy analysis of the economic status of black Americans. Jim's books explore a range of subjects about African Americans, including housing, labor market conditions, rural conditions, and family life. Jim has also published over 75 articles in economics and black studies, professional journals, as well as over 70 book chapters. And I have to admit, I didn't revise this. You know, this was a year ago, so you, know, you probably have added <laughs> at least 20 since then. The range is impressive and immense, so I will simply point out that one of Jim's primary scholarly contributions is in the history of African American economics and intellectual thought. His scholarship spans both mainstream and heterodox approaches, racial and gender inequality, African American economic history, immigrant earnings disparities, black worker cooperatives, union wages, micro foundations of macroeconomics, the economics of education, poverty, and so on and so on. And as if that were not enough to earn our admiration and praise, Jim is one of the early developers of stratification economics. Given all that Jim has contributed to the development of the history of African American economics, it is fitting that he is our 2021 Westerfield recipient during the year when we commemorated the 100th anniversary of African American Economist. And with that, I would like to turn our program over to three esteemed economists who will offer tributes to Jim, and in this order, Derek Hamilton, followed by Gary Dimsky, followed by Margaret Sims. Thank you. I'm going to start off with a little description of the institute that I direct, and Jim is a part of the inaugural class of senior fellows. The institute examines the intersections of race, social stratification, power, and political economy. We lead in advancing innovative models and practical solutions that promote economic inclusion, social equity, civic engagement, and racial and economic justice. Through these efforts, the Institute engages in strategic partnerships and produces actionable research intended to move policy and practice in fundamentally new directions that promote more broadly shared prosperity across race, gender, nativity, ethnicity, sexual orientation, and their intersections. I consider this my life's scholarly work, and there is no one better to represent that than Jim Stewart in the inaugural senior class. That, that was emotional for me that he agreed to do that because I aspire to be and do what he's done in his career. Um, I should also point out that uh, Nina Banks, who was just here, is a, she decided to spend her sabbatical year as a non-resident uh, visiting fellow at the Institute, so I'm grateful for that as well. But well... <laughs> Well beyond knowledge creation for the sake of knowledge creation, Jim is an activist. He will let you know about his stories from Cleveland. He's very proud of his hometown, if you know him. Uh, he's been engaged in, we were just sitting at the table, work on reparations before it was sexy. He's also a humanist. Professor Banks described him as a professor, that, as a per scholar who's been engaged in pursuing political economy work, particularly as it relates to black people and being included. But at his core, he's a humanist. And I think this is reflected in his work as well. His international work doing cross-national comparisons between the US and South Africa as it relates to inclusion. 
and not just academic work. He's been very active in participating in dismantling the racist apartheid structure and system. Everybody has described the ways in which he's led stratification economics. And in the 21st century, there has been a great deal of activity in this domain and in this field. But Jim was doing it before the 21st century. Back in the 20th century, with pathions that I would consider leaders in this field, W.E.B. Du Bois, Arthur Lewis, and the great critical race scholar Cheryl, Lew Cheryl Harris, also sits Jim Stewart. And if you don't believe me, take a look at his dissertation in 1976 from the University of Notre Dame, where I think I'm coming up with some new original idea. Jim has already thought about it and written about it. <laughs> People have talked about his interdisciplinary work. In fact, our scholarship is inadequate and incomplete if we don't have a humanist perspective and approach. And Jim's been leading with that. And he also has a critique for humanist scholars. It's not enough to have the aesthetics of our humanity to understand history through a lens of, of uh, storytelling and recreating narratives and events that have taken place without an analytical perspective to be able to decipher what happened and then come up with solutions going forward so we can have a better chart, a better history. We're inadequate as scholars, but Jim has been doing that work. So I know there are other people who are going to come up. I could go on and on about Jim, but I promised myself I was going to be brief. Let me say that the delivery of these flowers is long overdue to Jim. One day, I hope to be honored with a Westerfield Award and stand amongst the giants of scholars who've distinguished themselves at the highest level as it relates to black political economy. But I hope I do it like Jim. I hope I put the work before my ego. I hope that I exemplify the generosity and humility that he does. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's a Great honor to be here and thank you to Nina for the invitation and following Derek, I think that uh, you and I must have been reading, writing from the same hymn book. So, <laughs> but I'm gonna tell you about something about Jim that you don't know and the reason is that that's part of the man is his modesty. So uh, basically, Nina asked if I could repeat what I had written last year uh, in the virtual tribute and I couldn't find it. So this morning, in a panic, I got up to find, to pen a new fitting tribute. Um, following the old Polish expression, you can sleep when you're dead. That's, a, that's something they say in Eastern Europe a lot. Uh, but <laughs> I think Jim follows that too, I think. So, so here's my new tribute. For me, this, this man is a hero, not an icon, and I regret that Greg Price is not here so we can debate the, <laughs> the religious aspects of that. <laughs> so, <laughs> but a hero for me is someone whose actions we can use as a guide for how to better ourselves. This was embodied in, now here's the thing you don't know, in the UC Riverside Minority Pipeline pro pro Program. So I was teaching at UC Riverside in the late 1990s. It was a volatile time. The conflagration after the Rodney King trial put it in LA, put Californians, especially those in, uh, including those in the universities, public universities, into a state of racial emergency. What were the causes of conflagration and what were the pathways forward? So now UCR, where I was teaching, is a kind of little sister campus of the UC system. Um, it has embraced racial ethnic diversity in its student population for a, a while and it has built some institutional support for its diverse students. For example, there is a Center for African Students, there's a Center for Chicano Students, and one for Native American Students, has independent uh, centers for academic support and, and solidarity building. It has a proportion of black students, about six, seven percent 
higher than elsewhere in the UC system. And the uh, completion rate to degree for those students is actually above the average for the, the whole system. Now, at that time, Cecilia Conrad was leading the commission, the Committee on the Status of Minority Groups in the Economics Profession. She was teaching at Pomona back then, uh, also in inland Southern Cal. So we got together and uh, we, she proposed that we take advantage of UCR's ethnic diversity to try an experimental pipeline program. So whereas the summer program, well known, many students here, many people here are graduates of that program, focuses on people who have committed already to doctoral study in economics, the idea of our experiment was to attract students who were interested in issues of racial justice and racial equality before they chose their undergrad majors um, and to steer them toward further study in economics. Since economics as presented in introductory classes doesn't seem very relevant to many students interested in community issues, CC and I figured that a program that could, could be built. I, I was doing a couple of classes and one was kind of following the LA uh, trend, I, it was called the political economy of racial inequality, and the other one was an urban econ class where I got students involved in community-based projects. So we started the, in 1999, we started the AEA-sponsored Minority Pipeline Project at UCR. Had these two classes for non-majors, we brought in guest speakers such as uh, Curtis Haynes, Ron Oaxaca, Arturo Gonzalez, and Paul Ong. But the highlight of the program was a visit by Jim Stewart, May 20th to 26th, and you remember that, Jim, that was something. Um, now, I, his visit was formative for the students that by then we had gathered together. So let me first of all just, just think, it's six days, seven days, maybe minus the travel day. This is my report on what he did to the AEA. Quote, special highlight of the year's activities was a week-long visit to UCR of Dr. James Stewart. Uh, Dr. Stewart then describing, spent uh, the week of May 2026 in Riverside as a scholar in residence. He is currently president of the Association for Black Studies. He's also former editor of the Review of Black Political Economy and the former president of the National Economic Association. Dr. Stewart's schedule was extremely full. He had one-on-one -on -one meetings with EVC Warren and his assistant, with Professor Such and Professor Carter, with undergraduate and with graduate students. He was a special guest at the Economics Honor Society's monthly meeting, he discussed his career there as an economist. He went and gave lectures at Cal State San Bernardino and to an urban studies class and participated in a meeting of the African Student Alliance. That's an agenda that, you know, takes a lot of energy and he brought that to us. Overall, the, the, my report concludes, Dr. Stewart's visit was pivotal in galvanizing the interests of many UCR students in economic research on topics pertinent to minority communities. So what does this tell us? Jim was busy and already fully committed. He had given his all and has done to building institutions that advance black political economy, uh, black studies, and community pl policy str struggles. He was fully engaged, but he made time for these students. So Jim lives by a creed that was succinctly summarized in the title of an album by the late Max Roach, Deeds Not Words. And uh, the, the students loved him. They engaged with him continuously on many topics. They wouldn't let him go. Just hours and hours of talking in the office. And he showed them by his words and his example how one could succeed professionally and personally while investing in the independent, own controlled institutions that oppressed people need to advance their struggles for equality. Now, the, while he was with the students, the thing is he spent more time asking them questions with that puckish sense of humor that he has uh, to, to uh, then in lecturing them. They were sitting there in my office, they were discovering Walter Rodney and Malcolm X and Manning Marable and all of that, and they were getting very excited about all of that. And uh, they were taking ownership of their own readings. That was part of it. And Jim, Jim would just help them deepen their understandings. He would ask them questions. They were preparing a project. The students had decided they were gonna study minority-owned businesses in Riverside. And they wanted to, since they've been reading Malcolm and so on, they wanted to control it themselves. So Jim just uh, asked them questions to help them design it and shape it. And he did this all in his modest and self-effacing way. He didn't publicize his visit. You probably never heard about it. He just did it. And Jim taught these students and he teaches us that confronting the forces of oppression in this world is a journey to which one can commit. But it's not about us. 
the issues in their resolution have to be the focal point. Now, Dr. Anderson, I'm, here's my Philadelphia reference coming. Um, I learned this lesson before. I want to reference uh, Dr. William Meek, who had a part-time teaching job at the social work school at the University of Pennsylvania. Remember Bill? He was head of the, of, uh, he was one of the opponents of Rizzo and so on. So he taught a course, okay, are you ready? Those of you who are younger than some of us, uh, Bill Meek taught a course in the social work call, uh, that was school that was called, quote, Black Community Economic Empowerment, unquote. Now, let's bring it back, right? But uh, basically, I was having this conversation with Bill after going, being in the, it was Kensington, it was a mess. There was a dispute over Thomas Edison High School and uh, both white and black communities were disenfranchised by segregation where the school was, it was terrible. And I came back from a meeting where the people had been screaming on each other and it was just a terrible moment. So I came back kind of to Dr. Meek and said, you know, can you, you know, I can't take it. And he just looked at me and started chuckling. He said, Gary, this struggle is not about you. It didn't start with you and it's not gonna end with you. All you gotta do is be a wheel in the chain. Just be a wheel in the chain. Now, Dr. Stewart is a very big wheel in the chain. You're carrying it forward and there's a legacy of this time you had at UCR. Two of those students, that uh, one of those students became valedictorian. Another student is now a dean in public policy in New Jersey and that valedictorian is now also in higher education. And so basically, he's not just somebody who operates on one level, he operates on levels we haven't seen before. Now Derek, you told my, stole my thunder from my end. I'm just gonna say, I, since I moved across the Atlantic, I'm having to think more about comparative work and so on, I've been trying to do that. Recently had something in RBPE about the comparison of UK and US. But now Jim, he got there first. He had a paper called Historical Patterns of Black-White Political Economy, Economic Inequality in the US and South Africa, published in the RBPE in spring 1977. So this is a mark of the man. He may have gotten to where we are before we did, but he won't feel the need to remind us of that. Once we've caught up to him, he's always ready to walk together. Thanks for the, and congratulations, Jim. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to say a few words about Jim Stewart, but there have been many words so far this afternoon, and the question is, how can I add to that? Well, I thought I would go back to how I met Jim, but then I realized I couldn't remember when I met him. <laughs> it's like he's always been a friend and colleague. So I wondered, well, why is it I can't remember? I decided it was because Jim is not a person who talks loud and brags about his accomplishments. Instead, he just quietly goes about getting the job done. And what a job he has done. To refresh my memory on his various accomplishments, I downloaded a copy of his Vita that I'd found on the Penn State website. It included a record of over a dozen books authored or co-authored, about 65 articles, and 58 book chapters, uh, plus advancing over, advising over 40 PhD candidates. In addition, he had served as a consultant and expert advisor for black studies programs in diversity in the workplace. And when I stopped reading to absorb it all, I, I realized that the Vita was dated September 2007. Uh, so it didn't include everything he's done since then, such as heading up a sala. Uh, and, and so I, I, I then I thought, well, let me go back to thinking about some of my interactions with Jim. And one of my vivid memories of Jim's no drama approach to work was when he took over editing the review of black political economy. Some of the other potential candidates were concerned about the amount of work involved for this side job, 
actively soliciting articles, developing theme issues, and so on. But Jim was like, no problem. That wasn't because he didn't realize it was going to be a lot of work. It was because he seems to believe that wasting energy complaining or worrying is not what gets the job done. So I'm pleased that Jim has agreed to help launch the Black Economic Research Center for the 21st century, and I expect that Jim will continue to do what he has done throughout his careers. He won't make a splash, he will make waves. Now, I've been asked to tell you a few words about the purpose of the Westerfield Award. The Samuel Z. Westerfield Award was established by the National Economic Association, then the Caucus of Black Economists, in 1973, and it was named for its first recipient, Ambassador Samuel Z. Westerfield, Jr. The award is intended to recognize black economists whose professional activities demonstrate a superlative contribution to the goals of the organization, to promote the training of black economists, to encourage the dissemination of information and ideas concerning the economics of the black experience in the United States and abroad, and to promote the recognition and understanding of alternative perspectives on the black economic experience. Accordingly, the Westerfield Award recognizes contributions in scholarship, university teaching and administration, government and community service, and institution building. It is not bestowed annually, but only when an economist's work and contributions to these goals are clearly marked by singular distinction consistent with the highest standards of excellence and Jim certainly exhibits all of these characteristics and requirements of the award. Thank you. All right, we're not going to delay this uh, much longer. Um, it's my privilege and honor at this point to introduce uh, Dr. James B. Stewart, uh, our 2023 Samuel Z. Westerfield awardee. And you've heard a lot about him. I'm just going to briefly try to summarize that. Um, so as you've already heard, uh, James B. Stewart is currently inaugural director of the Black Economic Research Center for the 21st Century and a senior fellow at the Institute on Race, Power, and Political Economy at the New School. He holds advanced degrees in economics, a master's degree from Cleveland State, and a PhD from the University of Notre Dame. And he spent most of his professional career at the Pennsylvania State University uh, after assuming a faculty position in the economics department and directorship of the Black Studies program in 1980. You've heard a lot about all of the accolades, all of the publications, all of the different uh, veins of research and, and activism and scholarship that he's been involved in. So I'm not going to read on and on about that. It is all in the bio uh, published in the program. But I would at this uh, point like to invite Jim to the podium so that we may present him with the award. And let, I'll, let me just read what it says, and then we'll do the photograph. So it says, National Economic Association presents the Samuel Z. Westerfield Award, honoring James B. Stewart, PhD, Professor Emeritus of Labor and Employment Relations, African and African American Studies, and Management and Organization, Pennsylvania State University past president of the National Economic Association and editor of the Review of Black Political, Political Economy from 1989 to 1995, currently the inaugural director of the Black Economic Research Center for the 21st Century and senior fellow at the Institute on Race, Power, and Political Economy at the New School. For outstanding contributions to scholarship, institutional leadership, 
and service. The Allied Social Science Association's meetings, New Orleans, Louisiana, January 7, 2023. We almost needed two plaques for all of that. <laughs> but. So it's my honor, Jim, to award you with this plaque. Thank you so much. And And the mic is yours. Are you, you see me hobbling up here. It's, it's, uh, I'm dealing with a sciatica problem. It's not old age. <laughs> uh, I, I'm really sort of embarrassed by all of this because I've never really uh, sought the spotlight or really thought that much about what I've accomplished. I just try, try to do it. And in many respects, I believe that the best approach to moving scholarship forward and developing the type of policies and, and, and approaches that can be most useful in the struggle for uh, equality and, and uplift is really a collective process. So in, 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 in many respects, all of, all of you have had the opportunity to work with and to talk to over the years, you've all contributed to what I've, what I've produced. I'll talk a little bit about how I got here. I guess that, uh, that, that, that might be helpful. Uh, I first uh, encountered economics as an undergraduate in the 1960s. Uh, I went to undergraduate school between 65 and 69. And I was primarily, in, I was a math major, but I was primarily involved in so, sort of a, let's, let's call it black power activities uh, during, during that period. My, uh, the FBI, accused my roommate and I of running all the uh, protests in the state of Indiana, which was not true. It was just in Terre Haute. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I took an economics course there at, at the school, and I came to the conclusion that the best way to really deal with the long-term power, uh, power disparities was through economics. I actually went to work for a private sector organization when I first graduated and got my master's at night at, at Cleveland State University. And it was clear to me that the corporate life was not for me. So I decided that I was going to pursue a doctorate and I looked for programs that had courses in black community economic development. Now you can imagine there weren't a lot of those uh, <laughs> around. There were actually three places that I found. One was Harvard University, and I don't know who was teaching there, uh, University of Wisconsin and University of Notre Dame. Uh, I had a family at the time, uh, so that was an important consideration. Harvard didn't want me, so and that's all right. I didn't, in the long run, I didn't want them either, but that's <laughs> uh, Wisconsin gave me an offer, but it wasn't enough for, for me to take care of my family, and, but, and Notre Dame uh, did. So I, so I went to Notre Dame, and because I had a master's, I had a lot of flexibility in the, in the coursework. So I did take courses in sociology and in, in, uh, philosophy and law to sort of complement my efforts to really try to get a comprehensive understanding of the social forces that I wanted to deal with. The, the uh, faculty member there that I worked with, uh, most of you are too young to know the name, but Carby Samuels, Horace Carby Samuels. Uh, he, he's a Jamaican scholar the best intellect that I've ever encountered, but also he was very much a mystic as much of, as an economist. So he really taught me to think outside the box, to really not be uh, sort of tied to existing paradigms and to really look creatively at what, at what was feasible. So, uh, and I also took courses from a sociologist named Joseph Scott, who also, he did the same thing. I, I learned a lot about teaching from him that he, uh, didn't give traditional tests. He would invite students to come into his office and he would, he would just talk to them orally to determine whether or not they had mastered the material. And that was one, one, one of his examples. So that's where, so that's where I, I started out. And I fully intended to move, become sort of a, tra a traditional economist. But when I was finishing up my doctorate, the, the opening of the directorship of black studies came up. And you know, I told you what I did when I was an undergraduate. So, so I couldn't turn that down, right? So, so I was director of black studies, assistant professor of economics, and then I got mad at the administration, decided it was time to go to Penn State, where I took on the same positions. 
I got mad with the economics department. And some of you, some of you junior uh, faculty members, you might want to talk to me sometimes about those experiences. Uh, I would not have gotten tenure if it wasn't for the fact that I was involved in some university-wide activities designed to try to deal with the underrepresentation of African American students. Uh, uh, the I guess the department was had decided they were going to get rid of me. The dean had decided they were going to get rid of me, but uh, the president intervened and told them that they were going before I would. So, <laughs> so I moved on to the labor, labor and Employment Relations Department where I was tenured and moved up to the ranks and, and eventually became Vice Provost for Educational Equity. But the, but the highlight of all those years, I think, was there were three major student protests that occurred during that period of time from 1980 to 2009. And I guess what I would say is one of my major accomplishments was negotiating the end to all of those. Sa saving the president's butts, so to speak. <laughs> uh, and I've tried to take that approach in a lot of the sort of conflictual uh, situations that I've got involved in, to be able to negotiate, to try to hear both sides, but be able to, to, to bring some resolution uh, to, to the situation. Uh, I want to take a couple people to task. Uh, uh, I, I can't, when I move, when Carol and I, my wife Carol is, is, is sitting at the table. <laughs> when we moved to Florida from Pennsylvania in 2015, I had every, every intention to retire. I already re officially retired. I retired in 2009 from Penn State as soon as I could. <laughs> so, 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 so I was actually less than 62 when I said, no more, can't do this anymore. Not, and, and Carol retired in 2015 from her institution, so we moved, and I'm ready to s chill out and play racquetball and do something else. Uh, 2015, you know, Nina invited me to come to Bucknell to give a presentation, and I talked about the need to uh, revive, uh, re rebuild the Black Economic Research Center. Uh, a few years later, um, she, set, she sets up a committee to come up with a design for that and asked me to serve on the committee. You know, naive that I am, you know, I said, oh, fine, that, that sounds good. Lo and behold, the next thing that I know, well, we want you to be the inaugural director. <laughs> <laughs> the other person I want to take the task is Derek Hamilton. I said, okay, I can, I can do this Black Economic Research Center thing. I, you know, it's, it's, that, that's okay. Derek calls and says, uh, I want you to become a senior fellow at the, at the institute. Now, any institute with the name Institute of, of Power, Power and Political Economy and Race, you know I can't say no. That's, that's my, <laughs> so, so that's how I got, I got uh, tied to that. Uh, so bottom line, I, fight, I failed both Retirement 101 and 102. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm enjoying what I'm doing because when I look around the, this audience, I see so many people that are actively involved in, in fighting for the same things that I've tried to fight for over the course of my career. Uh, how many of you are associated with the Institute, please, in some way or other? Please raise your hands. See, that's just, that's just an example of, uh, and um, how many of you know the philosopher Mary Wells? Um, well, she was a full professor in Motown. <laughs> <laughs> And Mary Wells sung a song called Two Lovers. I got two lovers and I ain't sh Well, you, you know, African American studies is my other lover, so this, uh, other, other than, than economics. And I, I asked uh, three, three people to come to the luncheon today that represent that part of my life. Uh, VP Franklin, please raise your hand, VP. VP is a longtime associate of the uh, Association for the Study of African American Life and History and the former editor of the Journal of African American History. Uh, but he's also actively involved in the reparations movement on the national level. Al Colon is sitting next to him. Al, please raise your hand. <laughs> uh, Professor Emeritus, who's been actively involved in African American studies for, for, for probably 40, 40 years at least, I guess. Uh, and I've, no, I've known him for that p period of time. And Ed Collins, please raise your hand. It, 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 it. 
Ed and VP worked closely together, and Ed is an artist, and you could have had a piece back there. <laughs> um, Carol and I do collect art, and part of the reason that we collect art is because of the representations that it provides. It provides images of what's possible, what, what, what's, what's feasible in terms of, of the creation of societies and cultures that uh, are, are very different from what we currently experience. And I told her which one I wanted, but she not 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 going for it. So, <laughs> but uh, yeah, we 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 have we we have th that collection. What we try to do with that collection is to, is to invite people to come to see it, because we want to energize other people in the same way that it energizes us. And we take parts of our collection out to schools and to churches and other settings. And, and for me, that's part of the, the process of combining ways of knowing, ways of understanding to get richer and deeper uh, appreciations for the uh, cultures that we represent and the possibilities that we can produce. In terms of my scholarship, um, th there was a couple mentions of the South Africa piece. Well, that came out of my dissertation. And actually, the framework that uh, has be become more uh, I guess more visible now in terms of talking about racial identity as an economic model. That was in my dissertation, but I didn't think it was all that important when, when I did it, so it, it never really got fleshed out. But now I, I see in retrospect that I probably should have uh, done, done more with it at the time, and I appreciate everybody that's now re, uh, re revived it and is helping to refine it. And, this, and that's really the challenge. For the younger scholars, we need you to step up and to build on what we've done. Uh, you, you, are, you have better training that, than any of us have ever had, more opportunities, more access to information, uh, and so forth. And, the, and the, the situation that we are facing now is a challenging one, that, and I think uh, economists are best positioned of all the social sciences to combat some of the reactionary activities that are going on. And I'm going to give you one example just to... Um, I, I sit on the board of trustees of a small college in Florida, um, the New College of Florida, which is the uh, honors college. And in, in Florida, every public institution can have only 11 trustees. And it, in my institution, there were a number of, of vacancies that were available for the governor to appoint. The governor appoints some, and the board of governors of, the, of higher education appoints some. On the day we left from Florida on Friday, the governor appointed trustees to, uh, to all the open seats on all of the public institutions in Florida. And, you know, my governor is DeSantis, or the governor is DeSantis, not mine, but. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so he appointed six people to the new college board. And if you get a chance, you know, this, go, go look it up and see who he appointed. And you can, you can imagine. Uh, some of the most right-wing reactionary people that you can think of. So I got some new battles I'm going to have to fight. So that, that's why I need you all to help me with bu building on the scholarship because I've got to shift back. And uh, even though everybody just has talked about how what, what a uh, uh, easy demeanor I have, I may have to step it up a little bit to deal with it. <laughs> but it, but in any event, thank you all so much for this. Uh, this is truly the most important award that I've ever received, and I look forward to living up to the expectations associated with it. Thank you again. Thank you again for your service, Jim. So to those of you who I don't know, I'm Angelino Viseza, president-elect of the National Economics Association. And thank you again to all of you for joining us. So we have actually reached the conclusion of the program. However, before we end and go to our afternoon sessions, I just wanted to remind you of a few items. So first of all, <clears throat> we have several sessions still going on, so we would love to have you in those sessions this afternoon as well as tomorrow. On Sunday, we have two sessions in the morning. 
Also, this evening, we have the NEA ASH, American Society of Hispanic Economists, SEMGAP, the Committee on the Status of Minority Groups in the Economics Profession, and ARIB, the Association for Economic Research on Indigenous Peoples, do joint reception at 6.30. So we would, it would be great to see you there as well. Join us. And finally, I wanted to thank several actors that have been crucial in this process of preparing for the Westerfield and Cornerstone events here at the National Economic Association. So as you, Valerie mentioned earlier in the back, we have Ashe Cultural Center who is displaying several works of art. We are thankful to them for doing that. And if you have some time, please stop by and check the artwork in the back. This is in honor of Jim and Carol, of course, who as they have already said, are big collectors of black art. Also, we would like to thank all of the staff who have supported us, everyone from the videographers, photographers, but also the wait staff in the room who have been supportive of our events. Thank you. <laughs> of course, all of the sponsors with whom, without whom this would not have been possible, they are all listed in the program our super sponsor, the Institute of Race, right? Um, on power and political economy, Derek Hamilton's Institute, but also all the others. And I call them super sponsor because we had to upgrade them to diamond <laughs> at some point in the process and we're very grateful to your support of this event, but all the others as well. And finally, I want, when I mentioned their names for them to stand briefly, I know Nina already thanked all of them but all the members of the president-elect committee. So in alphabetical order, and those who are here, I have Fanaba Adu. Thank you very much, Fanaba. <laughs> Nina Banks, of course. Thank you, Nina. Jave Grooms, who's at Howard, unfortunately could not be with us, but was also instrumental on the committee. Thank you, Jave. And Hazel Robinson, of course. I, thank you, Hazel. I like to make the joke that basically we go to Hazel for everything. We need to move a table. We're like, Hazel, what do we do? I mean, she's, <laughs> she's just so pivotal in everything. So thank you, Hazel, for all the work you've done. Of course, our president, Valerie Wilson, thank you very much for all the work you have done. And Linwood Tahid, I know Nina mentioned him earlier. Thank you, Linwood, for your work. <laughs> Particularly on the Cornerstone event this morning, we appreciate that. So without further ado, again, thanks for your support of the NEA. We look forward to seeing you in the sessions. And we have a few minutes so you can you know, enjoy the art or mingle a little bit. Thank you again. Yeah.